Hi, everyone. Uh, you're listening to the DMBA podcast, where we share business confidence for designers. My name is Alan. I am a business designer and founder of the DMBA. And you're welcome to another uh, business design jam where we take current business news, business examples, uh, maybe a business concept and talk about the relevancy for the work of designers and business designers. Today, um, as often I'm used, uh, I'm joined by Franz, program director at the DMBA. Welcome Franz. Hi Alan. Hi everyone. And today we'll talk about how governments are threatening to sanction the big tech companies. Um, they are saying that companies like Facebook, Apple, Google, Amazon have too much power over our economy and society. And these companies are believed to hold a monopoly over their respective markets. So we'll have a look at what monopolies are and what are the implications also of working for such companies and what are the implications for consumers. But before we dive in, uh, if you're interested in these topics, so in the intersection of business and design, uh, I'd like to invite you to join our seven day mini MBA, which is an email course, a free email course. Where in the course of seven days, you receive seven emails, each teaching you a business concept that's relevant for the work of designers. Uh, so to subscribe to mini MBA, head over to d.mba slash mini minus MBA. And now without further ado, let's get into the monopoly, uh, game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, should we talk about the news that actually led us to this piece? Yeah, let's start. It is the American innovation and choice act that is currently in front of the U S Congress. And this act back actually aims at stopping big tech firms, actually, basically Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google, mm -hmm. uh, from using their market dominance for the worst for their business partners and also for users. And in a way, this is actually old news because the, um, it is based on an investigation that was um, conducted in 2020. Um, and it found that these big tech companies are engaged in anti-competitive conduct. That's what it says. Mm. So um, now it's back in the news again because dozens of companies and business owners sent a letter to Congress members urging them to support the bill, trying to get it through the Congress before they uh, head off to their summer break. And these companies are actually <laughs> um, not, let's say, small and insignificant. You would maybe think about some small vendors uh, that are just, let's say, obviously not in the power to compete with, um, for example, Amazon or any other of these listed companies, but it's actually signed by Yelp, uh, Sonos, DuckDuckGo, and Spotify. So mm. it's not, I mean, in a way it is, um, David versus Goliath, but also it's also, these are quite big companies, right? Yeah. Spotify is huge. Um, so yeah. So background is, um, this investigation showed that these companies, uh, big tech companies, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, they are self-preferencing their own products. They are intentionally disadvantaging other firms' products, and they're using data from independent sellers in their own advantage. And this sounds mm -hmm. a little bit technical. Um, so let's uh, also talk about some examples so we can actually understand how it actually looks like to um, assert your dominance in this market. So for example, they said that Amazon systematically lists products from its private labels and exclusive brands higher in the search results than the items from competitors that even had better um, customer ratings and higher sales. Mm, so even yeah, they those this. same, yeah. <laughs> and then you notice I, this? I always, yeah, I always like scroll through the first two pages just to just to go deeper and like, see, sometimes like you have certain really weird, like products on like on the first and the second spot. And I stopped, um, trusting those like placement on Amazon. I Google, yeah. like on Google, I still trust it, but on Amazon, like I really like have a look at the first two pages and then read reviews because yeah. I even had the sense as a user that something is off. Yeah. Interesting one that you're also mentioning Google, because that's the second point. <laughs> so. Yes. So Google first page, we all know how important this is. 
Um, but actually Google gives 41% of the space on the first page to Google owned content. Mm -hmm. So Google images, snippets, frequently asked questions, videos from YouTube, maps, news, flights. Um, so that in itself is already kind of hard for everybody else who is in this space, because if this one page one space gets, um, let's say smaller. And if, um, Google actually uses 41% of this space on space on page one for their own content, um, that's hard for any business. But the next step is that actually, uh, apparently Google native content does not go through the same algorithm than independent content. So this mm -hmm. means that the first page result is not the best anymore, but the first page result is what Google wants you to see, plus about 50% of go, uh, the things that go through the algorithm and seem to be the best ones for users. Mm -hmm. So again, self-preferencing. And uh, last one, not really self-preferencing or maybe even more self-preferencing, but more aggressively, Apple. So basically forcing app providers to use their payment services for any kind of transaction that is done. So if you're listed um, as an app in the app store, then you need to use your, if you want to make payments through the app store, you need to use their Apple pay and they are charging 30% of commission, 30% of commission. So if you don't want to do this, you need to send people away to a separate page. They need to subscribe there, pay there, and then they need to come back into the app. So some companies UX, are doing yeah. this, but it's really, really yeah. Good. Yeah, I think Spotify is like aggressively like trying to move people into paying on their own website on Spotify.com. Uh, yeah. I'm I didn't research this, but I believe actually um, that if you subscribe through the app, it's not just thirty percent of the per first purchase, but it's like recurring. So if I'm a subscribed um, um, s subscriber, then it's not just thirty percent of my first monthly subscription, yes. but it's like forever of any revenue. So, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. You know, like obviously, then all of these companies are trying to get you to pay out of out of the uh, so not on Apple's platform. And I think some of them even offer some discounts for this. Yeah, that's true. Some companies do that. Spotify does this. Actually, I also read Tinder does this. So it keep, brings you away from the App Store um, to subscribe. So yes, there is ways around, but it's always worse, right? So and the reason why this matters is that these companies have significant power. So this could all be fine if you could just walk mm. away and use another service. But the problem is you basically can't. So mm. Amazon controls 36% of e-commerce in the US and in some like smaller markets, like for example, print books, they have 50% plus. Um, iOS is 57% of US operating systems. So. If you don't do this, you lose basically 57% of your users, which are usually also the more active users. So, mm -hmm. um, let's say willingness to spend is higher yeah. on iOS than on Android. And yeah, it gets even worse because 92% of online searches are via Google. So now thinking about these three examples that we just went through, it's just really, really hard to get around these companies. Um, which made us now think, right? These companies are in a way a monopoly and in a way it's also kind of the goal of every company to reach a state of dominance because it makes you successful. So that's where the, that's where this whole podcast episode actually came from. So today we're going to talk about what a monopoly is, um, how common big business practices when they're successful actually naturally lead into a monopoly or may even be the goal of creating such market dominance. And in the end, also talking about, mm, yeah, what negative impact such a market dominating position could have for customers and also for our society. Mm -hmm. I have an interesting, like connecting, um, mini anecdote, which is, uh, Peter Thiel, one of like the most famous investors, but he was also one of the founders of the PayPal um who are now known as paypal mafia because all went into different directions and all were all reinvested their money they got from paypal into very successful businesses so peter Thiel um had this really successful and really interesting um 
class at Stanford, which was then turned into a book called Zero to One. And in this uh, class, he said, and in the book, it's also like, competition is for losers, something like that. Maybe it's an exact quote, but it's like, maybe I'm paraphrasing. Uh, and the reason he's saying this is every startup founder that pitches to investors is always trying to say, we are the only ones doing like this. We will be a monopoly. And the funny thing is, once you become a monopoly, you are saying that you're not a monopoly. Um, and we'll talk <laughs> yeah. very soon why you're trying to <laughs> say yeah, that you're true. not. Um, but it's a funny thing. When somebody says that they're a monopoly, they're definitely not. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but everybody want to be. Yes, everybody wants if to be. If you are, then you try to convince everybody, hey, no, I don't exactly. have the power. I cannot, like, everybody would, everything would be worse if I would stop uh, doing this, which is actually what um, big tech companies are doing at the moment. So they're running exactly. ads. <laughs> they're and running ads in Washington, D.C. area where they uh, tell a story about how everything would be worse if this bill comes into practice. Mm. But actually, we didn't want to talk about the bill uh, anymore. We just wanted to talk about monopolies and how they come to be and um, yeah, yeah, what they are, what impact that have, do they have? I mean, first of all, I think we need to define what a monopoly is. Uh, and it's a really interesting and tricky question, as you will soon uh, see. So let's lay it out with what we know. So most of us watching or listening to this podcast have played a game of Monopoly. It's a board game and uh, you play with friends, usually when you're a kid with your parents, and it's, it's a way for you to get thought about the finance and stuff. But actually, if you think about it, the goal of the game is to become a monopolist. You know, like you want to bankrupt all the other players so that you're the only one left. And then it's game over. <laughs> <laughs> and in a way, it's exactly what happens in the real world, you know? So Monopoly is a market or industry or arena dominated by a single player. There are different ways to measure this, but let's say as a simple rule of thumb that you need to have 70 or more than 70, 75% of market share. But there are deviations, as always, with everything in business. And there are also different types of monopolies. Um, for example, you have sometimes government, so sometimes uh, monopolies are artificially created by governments uh, because it's the only way for a certain product or service that is important for the society to even exist. So yeah. if we think about, especially in the past, in the, ni in the um, 1900s, um, railroads, telecommunication systems, uh, power public grid. utilities, power grid, uh, even postal services, all of these had to be in a way monopolized for one company to even set this big infrastructure for it to become sustainable. Yeah. Um, and some of them are still monopolies. Like I wasn't aware that like us postal services still has a monopoly on the letter. So not on the parcels, but like on the letter delivery. Yeah. So that's one, right? So that's one type of uh, monopoly, which is created by government. Mm -hmm. Then we have, which actually legal makes monopolies. sense in a way. It Sorry? does make sense. It does make sense in a way, right? Because you're basically dividing startup costs by the number you're actually serving. So if you have huge startup costs, like building a power grid, it's not the best deal to have another competing company who builds the same power grid to the same companies because everything would just be more important, so, uh, more um, expensive. So you'd rather have one company building one infrastructure, serving everybody so it can be cheaper. And in this case, competition is not better, but actually is worse. Mm, exactly. And... So we have these like monopolies that are created by the government. So then you may be asking, why do we have monopolies that are fought by the government? You know, um, because sometimes there are certain companies that get so big that they're just dominating a certain space. And then this hampers like the economic growth, innovation, and that's just bad then for everybody, you know, because you have just one provider and then they are not incentivized to innovate anymore. But we'll talk more about it. Uh, also later. I just want to give one example, which is also very um, relevant to the topic we're discussing today. Uh, it's like one of the most recent and famous cases of uh, monopolies being fought by the government. And that was in the early 2000s, um, Microsoft versus United States. So United States were um, 
yeah, like suing Microsoft for being a monopoly. And specifically, uh, they were charged with the anti-competitive practices um, for its Internet Explorer browser. Do you remember this, Franz? Have you used the yeah. Internet Explorer? <laughs> I have. Uh, the, the fact that it was pre-installed. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and that was also actually the whole reason for this lawsuit is because it was pre-downloaded, pre-installed on every Windows OS. And it, it was basically damaging uh, competitors such as Opera and Netscape at the time, right? Mm. And right now, something similar is happening with Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook. And that's why we we're even discussing about this topic. The, the next thing I find really interesting is like, how do you define or how do you prove as a government or in general that there's a monopoly? Um, <laughs> Because when you have a lawsuit, you need to prove it, you know, and we said yeah. as a rule of thumb, you need to have more than 70%. And if it's 70%, it's easy. Like it's more or less, it's clear you're a monopolist. Um, but sometimes it's, it's something in between, you know, how do you measure this? How do you measure if something is a monopolist, like a company is or not? And you used, I think you said that Amazon has 50% of um, the e-commerce in the US, like the market share. Uh, I, I think, think you said something like this. Uh, 36 of the e-commerce. 36. Interesting. 36. Because actually you could say that Amazon has 5%, roughly 30% or 50%, yeah, depending, depending on how you measure the, it. Yeah. Exactly. So and you're talking about how big, what's the underlying market, right? Exactly. So is Amazon now e-commerce or is Amazon now retail or is Amazon now part of book sales? So depending yes. on which underlying market you take, you will receive different numbers and you could argue that Amazon has, I don't know, 6% of US retail um, uh, market share, which is tiny. Exactly. <laughs> and that's what, that's what Amazon will say, you know, and that's yeah. what Apple will say because Apple has only 50% of market share, 50% of all the um, phones in the world are Apple's. But yeah. if you look at certain markets, then it becomes a different story. But um, so like for Amazon, right? It's, as you said, roughly 5%. If you look at the whole retail, it's mm. roughly 30% or as you said, 35, if you look at um, the e-commerce, um, but it can also be 50 if you look at the e-commerce differently, because for all the people who have used in, uh, Amazon, you probably have noticed that there are certain products sold directly by the company and certain products that are sold like for the third party um, uh, companies. And basically if Amazon sells uh, a product for a third party, they're not calculating the full number of the product. They're just looking at their fee, you know, mm -hmm. because their fee is their revenue. It's not the whole product that they're selling. So there's a difference between like something called gross, um, merchandise value. So if yeah. you look at gross merchandise value, which is all the products sold online, then Amazon has 50%. But if you look at the revenue that Amazon is bringing home, it's roughly 30%. And that's exactly what these companies are doing to prove that they're not monopolies. And it's so hard to prove that they are. That's why it's really hard to go to the, to the, to the court and, you know, prove that uh, there is a monopoly actually happening because you can always slice it. You could, for example, say that, um, of like the market in the market of the German sports cars. Um, and if you only look at the manufacturers whose name starts with P Porsche has a monopoly of 99 or hundred percent. So there's <laughs> always a ways to slice it and say, yeah, you are a monopolist. Mm, and that's a very important part. Like when it comes to the like business definition of monopoly, but if you look at the implications for the companies out there and for society, it's, it's much more clear. You know, you can see when something is, you know, hampering innovation and so on. Um, so why do companies even want to be monopolies? I think that's an interesting question also to, to answer. And, uh, as we said, I think before is like every startup founder is trying to prove to their investors that, oh, we have a hundred percent or 80% of this market. And the reason you want to do this is because you want to prove that you have an unfair advantage because unfair advantage means you can charge higher prices and nobody can, uh, change you, you know, nobody, like it's not easy for consumers to substitute your product with another product. 
So yeah. this is something called the switching costs. If it's hard for consumers to switch from one to another provider, then they're locked in into your offer. Um, so what this unfair advantage gives you is a couple of really important things. The first is called uh, pricing power. And pricing power basically means that, um, or in other words, pricing power is the effect that a price change has on demand. In layman's terms, so if I raise the price, like do people still buy, you know, like what's the elasticity of the price? And usually monopolies can, or monopolistic companies can raise their price much more than they would drop. So if even if they raise the price, still a lot of people would buy. So for them, um, they have a lot of pricing power, which is bad for uh, consumers and for uh, society at large. Um, and then there's a second thing called high barriers to entry. So being a monopolist gives you an unfair advantage that gives you also the high barriers to entry, which means that it's very hard for other companies to enter this space. It's maybe because of certain legal hurdles. Maybe it's because you, as you as a company is so big, like Amazon is so big that it's hard to get to this yeah. scale to compete with them and so on. Um, and I'll just say that in the technological sector, which is where a lot of, uh, us are working, there are a couple of things that companies usually do to become monopolist. One of them is just, just mention economies of scale, uh, which means that with each additional product that you're producing, the price per unit goes down. Again, in the simple definition, this means that like if I am, if I have a huge factory and if I can create millions of cars, it's going to be cheaper than if I create just hundreds, you know, because I can share resources and economies of scale just means I can produce it cheaper. Mm. So economies of scale is very important. And second thing is network effects and network effects are certain products that benefit from uh, more people using it. So if you think about Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram, the more people use it, the more friends uh, use this product, the higher the value is for you. And this means you have very little incentive to switch from WhatsApp to Signal or something else, because you will be the only one there, unless, you know, you can get a lot of enough friends to switch to the new provider. Yeah. So these are the reasons. So these are the two things, how you reach a uh, monopoly, which is having good network effects and having good economies of scale. So that's why a lot of founders and companies are looking for businesses that have inherent network effects. Um, and yeah, they provide you this unfair advantage of pricing power and high barriers to entry. Yeah. And the interesting thing to understand is that a lot of product design, business design, um, strategy work is actually going after exactly this. You're trying to reach economies of scale. You want, you want to try to be big enough in order for you to have lower cost. You are trying to go after a second concept is called economies of scope. So you're looking for mm -hmm. other products that you can produce that indirectly help your current product. Like for example, Amazon has a marketplace and Amazon has a Amazon web services because mm -hmm. It obviously makes sense to host your, like the biggest marketplace on earth, also not at a competitor, but at your place. So this is economies of scope. Then you want to look for lock-in effects. Lock-in effects cannot, is not like, it sounds bad, but a lock-in effect is something easy. Like my keyboard on Mac works differently than my keyboard on a PC. And that's mm. already a lock-in effect because I'm designing something in a way that is great. But as it is so great, I have it, I have a harder choice to go away from it. Mm. Then next one, creating entry barriers, also something that I'm trying to do. So I'm trying to own the most scarce resources myself in my company. I want to be dependent. I don't want to be dependent on somebody else. And in the end, network effects, like every company wants to try or wants to get to a stage that this is a self-propelled business model, right? Network effect means that the more people use it, the better it is for everybody. So if you reach a certain state, you will get your customers to do marketing for you because they benefit from bringing other, comp uh, other people to your, uh, to your business. 
So if I'm now switching to Signal, for example, then I want you also to switch to Signal because otherwise I cannot text you. So yeah. that's the network effect, right? So all of this in itself, all of these small bits and pieces that in the end lead to a monopoly if they work out are completely common business practices What everyone basically sits down every day and thinks about how can we make this happen? Because this is how we get competitive advantage. And this is the interesting thing here that yeah. it's not bad until it's bad. Yes. Right? So, so that's, exactly that's what you want to do in challenge. business. Exactly. Like you're starting out, you want to do exactly these things, but if you take it too far, then it becomes bad for like the, 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 all, all the stakeholders apart from you, yeah. the company, but on the long term is also bad for you. You get spanked by the government or whatever. And then hey, it's also not the best thing. And that's, that's, that's the interesting challenge here, like finding this balance. And I think it's, it's easier said than done because initially like no company, every company starts out, or let's say almost every company starts out with the idea. We want to be a monopolist with the realization that they will probably not be a monopolist. So you do everything you can to be a monopolist just to survive. Mm -hmm. And then if you succeed, you're like, oh, oh, I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> Yeah. Interesting thought. <laughs> because even a lot of unicorns are not monopolist. They're just like very, very successful companies, but yeah, they're true. like, you know, in a company or in a market where you have a lot of competitors or maybe just one, another bigger, like Uber Lyft or whatever, you're not alone. And in, in these cases you have really like huge mm -hmm. companies dominating the market. Yeah. Which is, as you said, great until it isn't. Yeah. And in the end, maybe it's the, yeah, I was just thinking about like, like what's the final step? What, what does, why can't Uber be a monopoly? I think it can't, I think Uber mm. can't be a monopoly. So what, where, where is this, like what market? I think there is also a type of market that, uh, you can, that somebody can reach a monopoly. And then there are other markets where it's just hard or maybe even impossible. Yeah. I mean. It really, it's such a tough topic because it really depends on the market or the type of product and so on. And we've seen most of the monopolies of the last 10 years, 20 years were in the tech sector because it's very easy to scale. It's very easy to reach like global, uh, audience. And with a lot of manufacturing companies, you need to own a very scarce resource and that's just much harder to do it's much harder to scale quickly and it just takes much longer to get there. Mm. So I've seen, I think that's why we've seen nowadays like huge mm, race in the, in the, in the tech sector, but even within tech sector, we have different stories. Uber, I think needs to think much more about setting like these small units in each country. So in a way it's not e as easy as, as it is for Google to scale operations um, mm. and so on. So, Every, every, every market is so different that even if you set out with exactly the same strategy, obviously you won't have the same results, but certain markets are just, let's say easier to dominate than others. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in the end, yeah, we got the situation of market dominance at the moment, right? Mm, um, yeah. maybe we should start talking about, um, effect of it. I think we have already talked a little bit about it, but yeah. we could still uh, dive a little deeper in it. So just in general, I think what we all want is healthy competition, right? Um, mm -hmm. So companies with good products and good services being able to succeed. And when, let's say when I, when I say succeed, I mean that customers are able or are choosing the best product. This is how companies succeed in a competitive um, environment, right? But the problem then with monopolies or even with, let's say market dominating power, um, is that customers cannot choose the best product anymore because the dominant players in the market make it impossible for new entrants to succeed, make it impossible for new entrants to build a business or even to be found by, by users because they control critical resources or infrastructure. They won the network effect game. So they're already so big that it's just getting bigger 
from its own energy um, mm -hmm. or they have so high negotiation power. Um, so I think as soon as there is this um, market domination, there is just um, this ability also to negatively use the power. And this is actually what happened, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, as somebody who was raised and born uh, in Slovenia, which was until 1991, like a socialist country, I can, from like the first hand experience, tell you what happens. Like, you know, when the country w went from socialism to capitalism, you had a lot of very big factories, mostly, who were just state owned, basically monopolies, mm. more or less. And after they were, you know, denationalized, so they were basically given to be run by individuals and private people. Um, well, the first thing that happened is also you didn't have monopolies anymore. So more companies would start out. And I uh, would remember one example, which was the telecommunications demonopolization, mm. where in the beginning you had just one company. And then all of a sudden there was, I was like 15 years old and there was like five of them all of a sudden. And <laughs> that was such a big impact for us as users, like prices went drastically down. The service yeah. went drastically up. We had much more offer. We could just choose among so many different things. And that just felt so awesome, you know, as a user, finally having yeah. a chance to choose. And you would have this feeling that you have a choice, you can change. And it's just like, it, it creates what we are used to until we aren't, which is <laughs> until we find ourselves in the monopoly situation. So that's why governments are fighting it because also, it's not good for us. Yeah, I fully agree. And I mean, we, we can see these examples, like we talked about having this power and having this huge, um, like dominating position in a market by controlling assets, by controlling, um, let's say being the, the place to shop, or let's say being the place to search or being the place to communicate. There are all these things that you can tweak to help yourself, but diminish others, right? So mm. you could, for example, and that's not you could, but it's actually happening, close certain infrastructure for other companies. So that's exactly what ha what you just described. So at the point in time we had, um, we had um, telecom monopolies and then they were broken up. Actually the same thing happened in the US just to a private company. So, mm. AT&T was once the biggest company in the world right. and in 1980 something, 82? 1982, I think. Yeah. Yeah. They got broken up and actually we have a very similar case again. Mm. Like I, <laughs> I can send a text message from one network provider to the others because back in the days, AT&T was broken up and, um, state monopolies were broken up. So we have now more, um, more, uh, companies. And these companies basically were forced to use their, uh, were forced to give their networks to others and were forced to open the, um, ecosystem, to open right. the ecosystem. But at the moment we have exactly the opposite, right? So I cannot send a text from WhatsApp to signal, mm. but I need to basically convince everybody to move to signal. So the more logical, if you just think, if you just repeat history, you could also just say, Hey, the, this is not how things can work, right? Mm. Why can't you need to open your APIs? You need to open your ecosystem so that people can freely choose whichever, um, messaging service they want mm. as in, and it's actually, it's the same, <laughs> actually, it's the same example again, or second thing that's happening is, um, again, forcing buyers to use their infrastructure at a very high price. So we are coming back to the Apple thing, forcing people to use Apple pay, even though there are plentiful opportunities to also, um, basically mm -hmm. organize paying. Um, and again, we're coming back to this favoring own content and favoring own content is the one thing. Um, so basically me showing what I want you to see instead of showing you the best thing, but it's especially harming when actually companies like Amazon start to vertically integrate. So. Mm -hmm they are selling services that, um, they are selling services and then they're competing with the buyers of this service. 
So Amazon sells the marketplace, right? So you as a seller can go there and you can sell, I don't know, um, a keychain. And what Amazon does is if your keychain works well because you're selling a bunch of stuff, then they will take this data and produce an Amazon basics product and basically put you out of business. And, um, it has happened. So even Jeff Bezos said, uh, there is the policy that marketplace data is not allowed to be used in this ways, but he cannot guarantee that this has never <laughs> been used this way. <laughs> <laughs> Did so, you really say that? <laughs> yeah. Wow. They, so that's very close to saying, I don't actually care. Right. So <laughs> maybe we did it. Maybe we did it very likely. We did it. So we have this policy, but actually we don't really care. <laughs> so when you see like there, when you see that there is this power, it's just very easy to use this power in a negative way. And the result is just no real chance for competition on the one hand, but also on the other hand, um, like better or worse, worse choices for, for users. So you'll get increased prices because dominance will, um, will obviously try to keep prices high. You will get less competition. Um, and even if a product is better, it's not going to reach scale. So it's again, maybe even contributing to less quality and it's contributing definitely to less innovation, because even if you have a great product, you have a very hard time to make it because mm -hmm. somebody else has the power to, um, hold you back. And I think now we're coming back to what is now the criteria for a monopoly. It's really hard to say because I actually don't care about the market share, right? It's much more about is somebody using their power in a non-competitive way mm -hmm. or in an anti-competitive way. And if this is the case, then yeah, that's not great for anybody except for the, um, purses of company of this company yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. And many of the listeners we have may actually benefit from this because they're holding Amazon stocks, Google stocks. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we are basically part of this, right? But that's another thing. Like if you're an investor, what are you looking for? You're looking for monopolies. Like that's the best bet yeah. in terms of stocks. You know, you want to have a company that has an unfair advantage. You want to have a company that has a high pricing power. Uh, you have a, want to have a company that's not easy to displace. It's not easy to switch. So we end up buying Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook. Um, and because it's just like, it's a good stock. I'm not saying I'm buying it. It's just like in general, um, because it just, if you look at again, the common practice of valuing the companies. These are like, pff, that's what you're looking for. Yeah. So coming back again just, to the thing that we said, these practices that lead to a monopoly are actually the most common business practices. As soon as you sit down <laughs> and start your own company, you do exactly this, but only in a very small scale. Yeah. 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 So the lesson here is try to become a monopolist, but don't become one. Uh, come, you can become a monopolist, but then don't be evil. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I think I, that's a good I, advice. Don't be evil yeah. in general. I think I'm Try not to the first good. one to say this, right? Who said no, that? No, no. <laughs> um, ah, a lot of people, <laughs> but there is a company <laughs> with a mission, right? Don't be evil. Don't do, I, don't do bad. I think we're back at the very start because I think that the very first Google, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the very first company, let's say, motto or um, yeah, whatever you call it, slogan was "Don't be evil." Google. Hmm. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> and and on this very very <laughs> cynical thing, we can also end here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Full circle, coming back. <laughs> yeah. Do you got more? No. Cool. Then. Um, Thanks everyone for tuning in to another business design jam. I hope you enjoyed our discussion on the monopoly. If you have a suggestion for another topic that we should cover, just reach out, you know, you can, uh, send us an email at hello at d.mba. We would love to know what other topics maybe you'd like, or even business news you'd like us to cover. And if you're interested in this intersection of business and design, you're welcome to also join us in the DMBA program 
or take one of our free email courses. Um, Mini MBA is the one that's like seven uh, days long. Over seven days, you will receive seven emails, each teaching you a business concept. And you can find that on d.mba slash mini minus MBA. Thanks again and talk to you and see you all soon. Bye-bye. Talk soon. Bye.